Thank you very much everyone for coming here today to hear this talk from the Oxford Guild Society with the one and only Kanye West. You're the lucky 350 or so who managed to get in out of a group of 5,000 plus students who balloted. So, uh, yeah, well done again. Um, we hope you are really excited for what we hope will be an incredibly inspiring event. Uh, Khan is very kindly taking time out of his incredibly hectic schedule to come share some of his insights with us. Um, we're very fortunate to have him here. Kanye West is a multi grammar and ordinary artist. You really definitely need an introduction. <laughs>
you know, I would look around at the work in the class and that feel inspired, that feel inspired by the teachers. Uh, and I kind of, you know, the idea of being a fine artist, you know, that's a really difficult profession to get into, to, you know, be respected in, to make money at. And, and maybe maybe the goal for some of the people were just to, you know, work at an uh, advertising agency or work at a record label or to, you know, you know, not truly end up, you know, being Jeff Coons or something. Uh, my goal, if I was going to do art, fine art, would have been to have become a Picasso. That was, or greater. Um, and that always sounds like so funny to people, the idea of comparing yourself to someone in the past that had done so much, that in your life you're not allowed to even think you can do as much. You know, that's a, that's a mentality that suppresses humanity. I talked to Ray Kurzweil the other day and he just, the conversation was quick, but he, you know, he touched on the idea of thinking faster and reading faster, and I just thought it was like, super important to go meet with them. And I'm going to touch it to aesthetics, it'll come to aesthetics. Um, uh, and the progression from me doing that first artwork to uh, So Help Me God, you know, artwork. Um, so some of you here probably remember the night when the Don tweets came through me and I started talking about probably professions that you guys are going into in the future that seemed like they had nothing to do with a rap. Uh, but what I was talking about was a, a band of thinkers that could remove religion, race, gender, and politics and somehow come together to find solutions for a broken planet. Um, we, we have the resources as a civilization to find a utopia, but we're led by the most greedy, the least noble, and what I notice about creatives, and one of the reasons why I get in trouble, is not only did I want to design video games or make music or ride bikes, I think one of the most important things to my ability to create so much in the past 12, 13 years is my desire to play sports. And I approach creativity like a sport, where if I had a drawing, I would react just like a job. Look at that fucking drawing right there, yeah! <laughs> Of course, we've been taught as for you know people in this room that that draw or you know think on the an aesthetic that, that creative aesthetics because we're all creatives here. We're all our born artists, but some people are artists of business. <laughs> some people are artists of conversation. Some people, you know, uh, but particularly for the aesthetic driven creatives, you know, we were taught to. You know, hide our black fingernail polish and put our head down in the back of the class and not be noticed out of fear that someone might laugh at one of our ideas or that our idea could become a mockery or uh, a failure in some way. Um, there's a uh, a Bible saying, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. The, so recently I've been doing interviews, and I've had to go back to this first because I don't think there's a living celebrity with more weapons formed against them. <laughs> but I also don't think there's one more prosperous. So what weapons have prospered? 
the smoke and mirror of opinions. You know, I, I was sitting with Steve McQueen because he <laughs> shot uh, my he shot the, the visuals for all day two days ago. Uh, and that's completely different than the Brit Awards. Um, and I told him this so it doesn't get taken out of context. I'm going to use the word like. I'm not saying it is. I'm using it as a comparison for people who want to say, Kanye goes to Oxford and tells everyone that this what I'm about to say. <laughs> and I'm not telling you this. I'm telling you what I told Steve McQueen in private. <laughs> but what I said was, the Matrix is like the Bible of the post-information age. I compared it like when the hundred guys, the thousand guys, you know, come at Neo. Like those, those are opinions. That's perception. That's tradition. Attacking you from every which angle possible. But if you have a focused why, And you have master senseis like Lawrence Fishburne. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a squad behind you. You literally can put the world in slow motion. Like if Michael Jordan talks about the rim, you know, being wired. And it's felt to me, you know, firsthand, as firsthand experience. You know, it's still February, correct? This is part of the I can't say this statement anymore, but for the first two months, me and my team would like look at each other and say, uh, by the way, I don't know days of week, so I don't know my days of week. I just go to exactly where my appointments. Uh, we would just look at each other and say, it's still February. For the sheer amount of work that we were able to put into the world. Some of the stuff had been worked on for uh, years coming, months coming. But nonetheless, <coughs> they just came back to back to back too bad, too bad, answering every crazy interview question, slam dunking, blocking every shot, catching every rebound. And aside from the right that I don't have to give my opinion publicly about artists, uh, I probably would have been bad in 2000. I know that's incorrect also. Uh, you know, This humanity that I talk about, this civilization that I talk about, this future utopia idea that I talk about, can only happen through collaboration. One of the things that I loved about Elon Musk, and I kind of, you know, and I love Steve Jobs, you know, that's like my favorite person, but it's one thing that disappointed me. It was when Steve passed, he didn't get the ideas up. That was kind of selfish. And you got, you know that Elon was like, yo, take these ideas, because maybe there's some companies outside of Apple that could work on them and push humanity forward. Maybe the stockbrokers won't like that, you know, the stockholders wouldn't like the idea of Steve giving his ideas out. But, you know, ideas are free. And you can't be selfish with them. And I think that that's been a progression of mine. with the advent of a human being named Drake. Uh, <laughs> you know, this idea of holding on to a number one spot, and then you get this guy that comes and blows out the water every number one of any band ever, be it me or Paul McCartney. Mountaintop, fine.
economy and walk down and readjust and see what your position on earth can be. And I've had all of these mixed emotion, mixed feelings based off of, uh, you know, bigotries, walls, perceptions that I've had to deal with. Ones that drove me to titles like Black Skinhead or I Am a God. Now I understand that I'm a servant. And with my voice and with the information and my ability to build relationships with amazing people or speak to amazing people or call Elon Musk out of the blue or call Obama out of the blue. He calls the home phone, by the way. <laughs> Responsibility to serve. Why do I say the matrix is like the Bible? And what is my definition of the matrix? I work with this artist named Vanessa B. Croft, and she, before our uh, presentation in New York, the Adidas collaboration. She bought my daughter some um, some toys, and it would be interesting because I would see pe toys that you know people would buy my daughter. I would say this toy isn't quality. I don't want my daughter playing with this, and it could seem somehow elitist or something like that. I was like, no, it's not enough love put into this. This is just manufactured, you know, with the will to sell, but not the will to give an inspiration. So Vanessa is very irreverent and very focused. She's like my eye. She's a piece of my brain. And um, she bought my daughter these three wolves, knowing that the whole collection would play the song Wolves and be based on this concept. And when my daughter saw these wolves, I had never seen her happier. She was going so crazy. She was grabbing one. She was riding on top of one. She was just running around. I've never seen her happier than this moment. Um, and that level of happiness seems to be the thing that we're fighting for every day, that we're trying to buy back, that we're trying to work for, that we're trying to hope that, you know, especially in America. Uh, you know, America, people really do wear like $3,000 Shirts, you know, it's uh, for real. Like out here in here in Stockholm, the, the people are just like, come on, dude, that's like a three thousand dollar shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that I'm probably buying a two thousand dollar. I got a free designer. So. <laughs> um, but that joy, that idea of joy, what makes you happy? What makes you happy inside? We've been sold a concept of joy constantly, you know, through advertising, through car advertisement, through, you know, fashion branding. You know, it's not the concept of time, you know, time with your family, time with your friends, the little time that we do have on Earth, the existence of the human race and what we do with that. It somehow was sold to us through a Gucci bag or something. Uh, I, I have something I say all the time, I'm going to say it again. Time, in my opinion, time is the only luxury. It's the only thing you can't get back. If you lose your luggage, I'm not going to say the obvious name of the luggage that I would normally say because I actually have a meeting with them soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if you lose your expensive luggage uh, at the airport, you can get that back can't get the time back. And everyone knows that when you're younger, time moves way slower. Summers take so much longer. Class takes so much longer. Uh, it feels like people do everything in life, you know, I'm going to speak from an American perspective, to get this like BMW or this Benz get this town home. You get 2.5 kids exactly. One of them has to be small. You know? <laughs> and, um, and you're looking for this moment where you sit in your BMW 
of you, after all the work that you've done and all the accolades that you got and all the, you know, how big your house is and everything, and somehow you think you're going to get that level of joy, you know, that my daughter had when she received those wolves. And as you're sitting in traffic in your BMW, it's something that, you know, feels empty to everyone who reaches that point. You know, this concept of the selfish human, this idea of separation by race or gender or religion or age or my favorite thing to hate, class. People say a village, uh, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. People ask me, you know, how my daughter is doing. Uh, she's only doing good if your daughter is doing good. We're all one family. Like literally, last names aside, we're all one family. And we have the ability to approach our race like ants, or we have the ability to approach our race like crabs. And it's so many ideas that create division. There's certain things that have been beat in a way, some way, race, whatever. You know, this I this is a generation that is far less racist. It's only very, you know, we have small remnants of even thinking of calling someone separately a, a racial slur. Like white people that listen to rap say it in the privacy of their own home. <laughs> You guys are being taught without you knowing it 
ways to separate yourselves from each other. If you're separated, you can be easily controlled. If you're too busy pointing fingers at each other as opposed to holding hands, you can't get anything done. You know, Chris Rock called my album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Um, Chris Rock and everybody else in every single media publication called My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy the best album of the past 25 years. Um, this only came through collaboration. One of the most memorable things about My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy was Nicki Minaj and the fact that she kicked my ass <laughs> on my song, on one of the best albums, the best album. <laughs> I'm just saying what the critics said. <laughs> of the past 25 years. Uh, that in that the best album of the past 25 years that I spent a year and a half making after I was Exiled. Exiled from my country. It was a personal exile, but exiled <laughs> from my country to come back and deliver the magnum opus of a work and to be outshined, to be beat by a girl, basically. <laughs> um, this was necessary. I think it was one of the most important points of working on that album was to not stop her from her moment because of how good she did. So, just to give a comparison but not a complaint, if you think about why did it take so long for the new Yeezys to come out, why did, it, why did I have to leave? you know, one group and go to the other group. Why did that group not want to speak to me? I think that the Yeezys I was doing over there were comparable to that Nicki Minaj first. Because these guys would work three years on a project. We got, we're gonna break out this shoe, and it's gonna, we're, we're gonna ramp it up by the Olympics, and we're gonna put it on this celebrity and this, and then the heads, son would come and say, my favorite shoe is the Yeezy. Like,
Because all of them are like, what are you doing? She's like, wow. To just deliver back to back to back extremely successful, inspiring, groundbreaking, visual, visceral, creative moments that otherwise would have been challenged. And the kid from Chicago screaming in interviews and screaming from the top of the stage for 40 minutes in a row had to pull that card out a few times. Not particularly screaming, but remember, I will scream. My mama taught me if I was in a grocery store in an aisle by myself and a stranger grabbed my hand, scream at the top of your fucking lungs. <laughs> So when I'm, I'm, when I'm at a award show, a stranger grabs my hand and says, okay, um, <laughs> so we're going to use these moving lights, or we're going to go play the music right now before we define the look, or we're going to just keep the cameras cutting in a, a traditional TV way. I'll scream at the top of my fucking lungs. <laughs> People say, I have a bad reputation. I think I got the best reputation in the building. <laughs> because they want you to have the reputation of tucking your black nail polish into your pockets and sitting in the corner of the class and that fighting for your ideas out of fear of being ridiculed. Someone that liking your thoughts, being embarrassed, being talked about, you know, the next day, not being accepted, being an outsider, being crazy. That's another one of my favorite ones, to be called crazy. Um, I'm nowhere near as smart as either of my parents. They were both educators, both had PhDs. So, I always feel embarrassed when I speak in comparison to the, I mean, my mom was head of the English department. You know, my dad is an incredible, you know, orator and humanitarian. Just five years ago, he stayed at a homeless shelter to help, to help. He worked on the idea of good water and created these water distillers in uh, somewhere in between Maryland and Delaware, I'm forgetting the exact location. Uh, and he put together this good water distiller cafe where kids could also read poems, bands could play, come and just read, get on the internet, and have everything driven by clean water. I remember calling him when he was busy nailing the planks of wood together himself. You know, I had given him uh, some money to, to work on the idea. I remember when I was young and I saw my dad working on computers. This was before Steve Jobs. Like, everybody just felt they could start a computer company. Like, my dad started a computer company. And uh, I remember the guy that he was working with him ended up being a bad guy and not knowing what he's doing. And, you know, just being like, uh, word around like a scam, an idea. Like, computers are going to be the next thing. Let's start our own computer company. And the guys that helped him, that he had the voice to find, that he looked at whatever the version of Craigslist was back then, uh, to find, didn't have the same motivation, didn't have a high enough skill set to match up to his vision, to his dream, for it to be considered to be a success. But the success is that his successor will be successful in his lifetime. 
and you can say, oh, well, you are successful. I'm successful in learning about the beauty that is afforded rich people. But in learning that, being growing up middle class, it's something that's beating out of my chest that screams out, wait a second, I was middle class and I didn't get to see none of this shit. So let's have an NBC telethon moment and say that beauty has been stolen from the people and sold back to them under the concept of luxury. It's not illegal to not listen to music. It's illegal to not wear clothes and also possibly extremely cold. <laughs> uh, so that means that someone is proposing an idea on you that you legally have to do. Clothing should be like food. This should never be a $5,000 sweater. You know what should cost $5,000? A car should be $5,000. And you know who should work on a car? The people who work on the $500,000 cars. All the best talent in the world needs to work for the people. And I am so fucking serious about this concept that I will stand in front of anyone and fight for it. Because I was 14 and middle class. I know what it felt like to not be able to have So if people say to me, but you're successful, what are you crying about? I'm crying about the people. I'm crying about their daughters, our daughters, as one family. What good is it? What good is anything that everyone can't have? Every ism, they think that we're done with racism. What about elitism? What about separatism? What about classism? 